Part 1, Chapter 5 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in August 2017. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes May Clark. Chapter 5 comets part one newton showed that the bodies known as comets or hirsute stars obey the law of gravitation but it was by no means certain that the individual of the species observed by him in sixteen eighty formed a permanent member of the solar system the velocity in fact of its rush round the sun was quite possibly sufficient to carry it off for ever into the depths of space there to wander a celestial casual from star to star with another comet however which appeared two years later the case was different edmund halley who afterwards succeeded flamsteed as astronomer royal calculated the elements of its orbit on newton's principles and found them to resemble so closely those similarly arrived at for comets observed by peter appian in 1531 and by kepler in 1607 as almost to compel the inference that all three were apparitions of a single body this implied its revolution in a period of about seventy-six years and halley accordingly fixed its return for 1758-9 so fully alive was he to the importance of the announcement that he appealed to a candid posterity in the event of its verification to acknowledge that the discovery was due to an englishman the prediction was one of the test questions put by science to nature on the replies to which largely depend both the development of knowledge and the conviction of its reality in the present instance the answer afforded may be said to have laid the foundation of this branch of astronomy halley's comet punctually reappeared on christmas day seventeen fifty eight and effected its perihelion passage on the twelfth of march following thus proving beyond dispute that some at least of these erratic bodies are domesticated within our system and strictly conform if not to its unwritten customs so to speak at any rate to its fundamental laws their movements in short were demonstrated by the most unanswerable of all arguments that of verified calculation to be calculable and their investigation was erected into a legitimate department of astronomical science this notable advance was the chief result obtained in the field of inquiry just now under consideration during the eighteenth century but before it closed its cultivation had received a powerful stimulus through the invention of an improved method the name of albers has already been brought prominently before our readers in connection with asteroidal discoveries these however were but chance excursions from the path of cometary research which he steadily pursued through life an early predilection for the heavens was fixed in this particular direction by one of the happy inspirations of genius as he was watching one night in the year seventeen seventy nine by the sick-bed of a fellow-student in medicine at Göttingen, an important simplification in the mode of computing the paths of comets occurred to him although not made public until seventeen ninety seven albus's method was then universally adopted and is still regarded as the most expeditious and convenient in cases where absolute rigour is not required by its introduction not only many a toilsome and thankless hour was spared but workers were multiplied and encouraged in the prosecution of labours more useful than attractive the career of heinrich olbers is a brilliant example of what may be done by an amateur in astronomy he at no time did regular work in an observatory he was never the possessor of a transit or any other fixed instrument moreover all the best years of his life were absorbed in the assiduous exercise of a toilsome profession born in seventeen fifty eight at the village of arbergen where his father was pastor he settled in seventeen eighty one as a physician in the neighbouring town of bremen 
and continued an active practice there for over forty years. It was thus only the hours which his robust constitution enabled him to spare from sleep that were available for his intellectual pleasures. Yet his recreation was, as von Sach remarked, no less prolific of useful result than the severest work of other men. The upper part of his house in the Sandgasse was fitted up with such instruments and appliances as restrictions of space permitted, and there, night after night during half a century and upwards, he discovered, calculated, or observed the cometary visitants of northern skies. Almost as effective in promoting the interests of science as the valuable work actually done by him was the influence of his genial personality. He engaged confidence by his ready and discerning sympathy, he inspired affection by his benevolent disinterestedness, he quickened thought and awakened zeal by the suggestions of a lively and inventive spirit, animated with the warmest enthusiasm for the advancement of knowledge. Nearly every astronomer in Germany enjoyed the benefits of a frequently active correspondence with him, and his communications to the scientific periodicals of the time were numerous and striking. The motive power of his mind was thus widely felt and continually in action, nor did it wholly cease to be exerted even when the advance of age and the progress of infirmity rendered him incapable of active occupation. He was, in fact, alive even to the last day of his long life of eighty-one years, and his death, which occurred March 2, 1840, left vacant a position which a rare combination of moral and intellectual qualities had conspired to render unique. Amongst the many younger men who were attracted and stimulated by intercourse with him was Johann Franz Enke. But while Olbers became a mathematician because he was an astronomer, Enke became an astronomer because he was a mathematician. A born geometer, he was naturally sent to Göttingen and placed under the tuition of Gauss. But geometers are men, and the contagion of patriotic fervor which swept over Germany after the Battle of Leipzig did not spare Gauss's promising pupil. He took up arms in the Hanseatic Legion and marched and fought until the oppressor of his country was safely ensconced behind the ocean walls of St. Helena. In the course of his campaigning he met Lindenau, the militant director of the Seaberg Observatory, and by his influence was appointed his assistant, and, eventually, in 1822, became his successor. Thence he was promoted in 1825 to Berlin, where he superintended the building of the new observatory, so actively promoted by Humboldt, and remained at its head until within some eighteen months of his death in August 1865. On the 26th of November 1818, Pons of Marseille discovered a comet whose inconspicuous appearance gave little promise of its becoming one of the most interesting objects in our system. Enke at once took the calculation of its elements in hand, and brought out the unexpected result that it revolved round the sun in a period of about three one-third years. He, moreover, detected its identity with comets seen by Mechain in 1786, by Caroline Herschel in 1795, by Pons, Hout, and Bouvard in 1805, and after six laborious weeks of research into the disturbances experienced by it from the planets during the entire interval since its first ascertained appearance, he fixed May twenty fourth, eighteen twenty two, as the date of its next return to perihelion. Although on that occasion, owing to the position of the Earth, invisible in the northern hemisphere, Sir Thomas Brisbane's observatory at Paramatta was fortunately ready equipped for its recapture which Rümke effected quite close to the spot indicated by Enke's ephemeris. The importance of this event can be better understood when it is remembered that it was only the second instance of the recognized return of a comet, that of Halley's, sixty-three years previously, having, as already stated, been the first, and that it, moreover, established the existence of a new class of celestial object, somewhat loosely distinguished as comets of short period. 
these bodies of which about thirty have been found to circulate within the orbit of saturn are remarkable as showing certain planetary affinities in the manners of their motions not at all perceptible in the wider travelling members of their order they revolve without exception in the same direction as the planets from west to east they exhibit a marked tendency to conform to the zodiacal track which limits planetary excursions north and south and their paths around the sun although much more eccentric than the approximately circular planetary orbits are far less so than the extravagantly long ellipses in which comets comparatively untrained as it were in the habits of the solar system ordinarily perform their revolutions no great comet is of the planetary kind these are indeed only by exception visible to the naked eye they possess extremely feeble tail-producing powers and give small signs of central condensation thin wisps of cosmical cloud they flit across the telescopic field of view without sensibly obscuring the smallest star their appearance in short suggests what some notable facts in their history will presently be shown to confirm that they are bodies already effete and verging towards dissolution if it be asked what possible connection can be shown to exist between the shortness of period by which they are essentially characterized and what we may call their superannuated condition we are not altogether at a loss for an answer kepler's remark that comets are consumed by their own emissions has undoubtedly a measure of truth in it the substance ejected into the tail must in overwhelmingly large proportion be for ever lost to the central mass from which it issues true it is of a nature inconceivably tenuous but unrepaired waste however small in amount cannot be persisted in with impunity the incitement to such self-spoilation proceeds from the sun it accordingly progresses more rapidly the more numerous are the returns to the solar vicinity comets of short period may thus reasonably be expected to wear out quickly they are moreover subject to many adventures and vicissitudes their aphelia or the farthest points of their orbits from the sun are usually if not invariably situated so near to the path either of jupiter or of saturn as to permit these giant planets to act as secondary rulers of their destinies by their influence they were in all likelihood originally fixed in their present tracks and by their influence exerted in an opposite sense they may in some cases be eventually ejected from them careers so varied as can easily be imagined are apt to prove instructive and astronomers have not been backward in extracting from them the lessons they are fitted to convey Encke's comet above all has served as an index to much curious information and it may be hoped that its function in that respect is by no means at an end the great extent of the solar system traversed by its eccentric path makes it peculiarly useful for the determination of the planetary masses at perihelion it penetrates within the orbit of mercury it considerably transcends at aphelion the farthest excursion of pallas its vicinity to the former planet in august eighteen thirty five offered the first convenient opportunity of placing the body in the astronomical balance its weight or mass had previously been assumed not ascertained and the comparatively slight deviation from its regular course impressed upon the comet by its attractive power showed that it had been assumed nearly twice too great that fundamental datum of planetary astronomy the mass of jupiter was corrected by similar means and it was reassuring to find the correction in satisfactory accord with that already introduced from observations of the asteroidal movements the fact that comets contract in approaching the sun had been noticed by hevelius Pongre admitted it with hesitating perplexity. The example of Encke's comet rendered it conspicuous and undeniable. On the 28th of October, 1828, 
the diameter of the nebulous matter composing this body was estimated at three hundred twelve thousand miles it was then about one and a half times further from the sun than the earth is at the time of the equinox on the twenty fourth of december following its distance being reduced by nearly two-thirds it was found to be only fourteen thousand miles across that is to say it had shrunk during those two months of approach to one eleven thousandth part of its original volume yet it had still seventeen days journey to make before reaching perihelion the same curious circumstance was even more markedly apparent at its return in eighteen thirty eight its bulk or the actual space occupied by it appeared to be reduced as it drew near the hearth of our system in the enormous proportion of eight hundred thousand to one a corresponding expansion accompanied on each occasion its retirement from the sphere of observation similar changes of volume though rarely to the same astounding extent have been perceived in other comets they still remain unexplained but it can scarcely be doubted that they are due to the action of the same energetic internal forces which reveal themselves in so many splendid and surprising cometary phenomena another question of singular interest was raised by Encke's acute inquiries into the movements and disturbances of the first known comet of short period he found from the first that its revolutions were subject to some influence besides that of gravity after every possible allowance had been made for the pulls now backward now forward exerted upon it by the several planets there was still a surplus of acceleration left unaccounted for each return to perihelion took place about two and a half hours sooner than received theories warranted here then was a residual phenomenon of the utmost promise for the disclosure of novel truths Enke, in accordance with the opinion of olbers explained it as due to the presence in space of some such subtle matter as was long ago invoked by euler to be the agent of eventual destruction for the fair scheme of planetary creation the apparent anomaly of accounting for an accelerative effect by a retarding cause disappears when it is considered that any check to the motion of bodies revolving round the centre of attraction causes them to draw closer to it thus shortening their periods and quickening their circulation if space were filled with a resisting medium capable of impeding even in the most infinitesimal degree the swift course of the planets their orbits should necessarily be not ellipses but very close elliptical spirals along which they would slowly but inevitably descend into the burning lap of the sun the circumstance that no such tendency can be traced in their revolutions by no means sets the question at rest for it might well be that an effect totally imperceptible until after the lapse of countless ages as regards the solid orbs of our system might be obvious in the moments of bodies like comets of small mass and great bulk just as a feather or a gauze veil at once yields its motion to the resistance of the air while a cannon-ball cuts its way through with comparatively slight loss of velocity it will thus be seen that issues of the most momentous character hang on the time-keeping of comets for plainly all must in some degree suffer the same kind of hindrance as Encke's, if the cause of that hindrance be the one suggested none of its congeners however show any trace of similar symptoms true the late professor opolzer announced in eighteen eighty that a comet first seen by pons in eighteen ninety and rediscovered by winnecke in eighteen fifty eight having a period of two thousand fifty two days five point six years was accelerated at each revolution precisely in the manner required by Encke's theory but m von hertel's subsequent investigation the materials for which included numerous observations of the body in question at its return to the sun in eighteen eighty six decisively negatived the presence of any such effect moreover the researches of van asten and bucklund into the movements of Encke's comet revealed a perplexing circumstance 
they confirmed Encke's results for the period covered by them, but exhibited the acceleration as having suddenly diminished by nearly one-half in 1868. The reality and permanence of this change were fully established by observations of the ensuing return in March 1885. Some physical alteration of the retarded body seems indicated, but visual evidence countenances no such assumption. In aspect, the comet is no less thin and diffuse than in 1795 or in 1848. The character of the supposed resistance in interplanetary space has, it may be remarked, been often misapprehended. What Encke stipulated for was not a medium equally diffused throughout the visible universe, such as the ethereal vehicle of the vibrations of light, but a rare fluid rapidly increasing in density towards the sun. This cannot be a solar atmosphere, since it is mathematically certain, as Laplace has shown, that no envelope partaken of the sun's axial rotation can extend farther from his surface than nine-tenths of the mean distance of Mercury, while physical evidence assures us that the actual depth of the solar atmosphere bears a very minute proportion to the possible depth theoretically assigned to it. That matter, however, not atmospheric in its nature, that is, neither forming one body with the sun, nor altogether airy form, exists in its neighbourhood, can admit of no reasonable doubt. The great lens-shaped mass of the zodiacal light, stretching out at times far beyond the Earth's orbit, may indeed be regarded as an extension of the corona, the streamers of which themselves mark the wide diffusion, all round the solar globe, of granular or gaseous materials. Yet comets have been known to penetrate the sphere occupied by them without perceptible loss of velocity. The hypothesis, then, of a resisting medium receives at present no countenance from the movements of comets, whether of short or of long periods. Although Encke's comet has made 35 complete rounds of its orbit since its first detection in 1786, it shows no certain signs of decay. Variations in its brightness are, it is true, conspicuous, but they do not proceed continuously. The history of the next known planet-like comet has proved of even more curious interest than that of the first. It was discovered by an Austrian officer named Wilhelm von Biela at Josefstadt in Bohemia, February 28, 1826, and ten days later by the French astronomer Gambart at Marseille. Both observers computed its orbit, showed its remarkable similarity to that traversed by comets visible in 1772 and 1805, and connected them together as previous appearances of the body just detected by assigning to its revolutions a period of between six and seven years. The two brief letters conveying these strikingly similar inferences were printed side by side in the same number of the Astronomische Nachrichten, number 94, but Biela's priority in the discovery of the comet was justly recognized by the bestowal upon it of his name. The object in question was at no time, subsequently to 1805, visible to the naked eye. Its aspect in Sir Johann Herschel's great reflector on the 23rd of September 1832 was described by him as that of a conspicuous nebula, nearly three minutes in diameter. No trace of a tail was discernible. While he was engaged in watching it, a small knot of minute stars was directly traversed by it, and when on the cluster, he tells us, it presented the appearance of a nebula resolvable and partly resolved into stars, the stars of the cluster being visible through the comet. Yet the depth of cometary matter through which such faint stellar rays penetrated undimmed was, near the central parts of the globe, not less than 50,000 miles. It is curious to find that this seemingly harmless, and we may perhaps add a feet body, gave occasion to the first, and not the last, cometary scare of an enlightened century. Its orbit, at the descending node, may be said to have intersected that of the earth, 
since according as it bulged in or out under the disturbing influence of the planets the passage of the comet was effected inside or outside the terrestrial track now certain calculations published by albers in eighteen twenty eight showed that on october twenty nine eighteen thirty two a considerable portion of its nebulous surroundings would actually sweep over the spot which a month later would be occupied by our planet it needed no more to set the popular imagination in a ferment astronomers after all could not by an alarmed public be held to be infallible their computations it was a word which a trifling oversight would suffice to vitiate exhibited clearly enough the danger but afforded no guarantee of safety from a collision with all the terrific consequences frigidly enumerated by laplace nor did the panic subside until arago formally demonstrated that the earth and the comet could by no possibility approach within less than fifty millions of miles the return of the same body in eighteen forty five forty six was marked by an extraordinary circumstance when first seen november twenty eight it wore its usual aspect of a faint round patch of cosmical fog but on december nineteen mr hind noticed that it had become distorted somewhat into the form of a pear and ten days later it had divided into two separate objects this singular duplication was first perceived at new haven in america december twenty nine by messrs herrick and bradley and by lieutenant maury at washington january thirteen eighteen forty six the earliest british observer of the phenomenon noticed by wichmann the same evening at Königsberg, was professor challis i see two comets he exclaimed putting his eye to the great equatorial of the cambridge observatory on the night of january fifteen then distrustful of what his senses had told him he called in his judgment to correct their improbable report by resolving one of the dubious objects into a hazy star on the twenty third however both were again seen by him in unmistakable cometary shape and until far on in march otto struve caught a final glimpse of the pair on the sixteenth of april continued to be watched with equal curiosity and amazement by astronomers in every part of the northern hemisphere what seneca reproved a forest for supposing to have taken place in three hundred seventy three b c what pongre blamed kepler for conjecturing in sixteen eighteen had then actually occurred under the attentive eyes of science in the middle of the nineteenth century at a distance from each other of about two-thirds the distance of the moon from the earth the twin comets meantime moved on tranquilly so far at least as their course through the heaven was concerned their extreme lightness or the small amount of matter contained in each could not have received a more signal illustration than by the fact that their revolutions round the sun were performed independently that is to say they travelled side by side without experiencing any appreciable mutual disturbance thus plainly showing that at an interval of only one hundred fifty seven thousand two hundred fifty miles their attractive power was virtually inoperative signs of internal agitation however were not wanting each fragment threw out a short tail in a direction perpendicular to the line joining their centres and each developed a bright nucleus although the original comet had exhibited neither of these signs of cometary vitality a singular interchange of brilliancy was besides observed to take place between the coupled objects each of which alternately outshone and was outshone by the other while an arc of light apparently proceeding from the more lustrous at times bridged the intervening space obviously the gravitational tie rendered powerless by exiguity of matter was here replaced by some other form of mutual action the nature of which can as yet be dealt with only by conjecture once more in august eighteen fifty two the double comet returned to the neighbourhood of the sun but under circumstances not the most advantageous for observation 
Indeed, the companion was not detected until September 16, when Father Secchi at Rome perceived it to have increased its distance from the originating body to a million and a quarter of miles, or about eight times the average interval at the former appearance. Both vanished shortly afterwards and have never since been seen, notwithstanding the eager watch kept for object of such singular interest, and the accurate knowledge of their track supplied by Santini's investigations. A dangerously near approach to Jupiter in 1841 is believed to have occasioned their disruption, and the disaggregating process thus started was likely to continue. We can scarcely doubt that the fate has overtaken them, which Newton assigned as the end of all cometary existence. Diffundi tandem et spargi per coelos universos. End of chapter 5, part 1「1 Chapter 5 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in August 2017 A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clarke Part 1, Chapter 5 Comets, Part 2 Bielas is not the only vanished comet. Brorsens, discovered at Kiel in 1846 and observed at four subsequent returns, failed unaccountably to become visible in 1890. Yet numerous sentinels were on the alert to surprise its approach along a well-ascertained track traversed in five and a half years. The object presented from the first a somewhat time-worn aspect. It was devoid of tail or any other kind of appendage, and the rapid loss of the light acquired during perihelion passage was accompanied by inordinate expansion of an already tenuous globular mass. Another lost or mislaid comet is one found by the Vico at Rome, August 22, 1844. It was expected to return early in 1850, but did not, and has never since been seen, unless its reappearance as E. Swift's comet of 1894 should be ratified by closer inquiry. A telescopic comet with a period of seven and a half years, discovered November 22, 1843, by M. Fay of the Paris Observatory, formed the subject of a characteristically patient and profound inquiry on the path of Le Verrier, designed to test its suggested identity with Lexel's comet of 1770. The result was decisive against the hypothesis of Waltz, the divergences between the orbits of the two bodies being found to increase instead of to diminish, as the history of the newcomer was traced backward into the previous century. Fay's comet pursues the most nearly circular path of any similar known object. Even at its nearest approach to the sun, it remains farther off than Mars when he is most distant from it, and it was proved by the admirable researches of Professor Axel Möller, director of the Swedish Observatory of Lund, to exhibit no trace of the action of a resisting medium. Periodical comets are evidently bodies which have each lived through a chapter of accidents, and a significant hint as to the nature of their adventures can be gathered from the fact that their aphelia are pretty closely grouped about the tracks of the major planets. Halley's and five other comets are thus related to Neptune. Three connect themselves with Uranus, two with Saturn, above a score with Jupiter some form of dependence is plainly indicated, and the researches of Tisserand, Calandreux, and Newton of Yale College leave scarcely a doubt that the capture theory represents the essential truth in the matter. The original parabolic paths of these comets were then changed into ellipses by the backward pull of a planet, whose sphere of attraction they chanced to enter when approaching the sun from outer space. Moreover, since a body thus affected should necessarily return at each revolution to the scene of encounter, 
the same process of retardation may in some cases have been repeated many times until the more restricted cometary orbits were reduced to their present dimensions the prevalence too among periodical comets of direct motion is shown to be inevitable by m calandreux's demonstration that those travelling in a retrograde direction would by planetary action be thrown outside the probable range of terrestrial observation the scarcity of hyperbolic comets can be similarly explained they would be created whenever the attractive influence of the disturbing planet was exerted in a forward or accelerative sense but could come only by a rare exception to our notice the inner planets including the earth have also unquestionably played their parts in modifying cometary orbits and mr plummer suggests with some show of reason that the capture of encke's comet may be a feat due to mercury no great comet appeared between the star which presided at the birth of napoleon and the vintage comet of 1811 the latter was first described by Flaugergue at Viviers, March 26, 1811. Vizhnevsky at Neutyakasks in southern Russia caught a final glimpse of it, August 17, 1812. Two disappearances in the solar rays as the Earth moved round in its orbit, and two reappearances after conjunction, were included in this unprecedentedly long period of visibility of 510 days. This relative permanence, so far as the inhabitants of Europe were concerned, was due to the high northern latitude attained near perihelion, combined with a certain leisureliness of movement along a path everywhere external to that of the earth. The magnificent luminous train of this body, on October 15, the day of its nearest terrestrial approach, covered an arc of the heavens twenty-three and a half degrees in length, corresponding to a real extension of one hundred millions of miles. Its form was described by Sir William Herschel as that of an inverted hollow cone, and its colour as yellowish, strongly contrasted with the bluish-green tint of the head round which it was flung like a transparent veil. The planetary disk of the head, 127,000 miles across, appeared to be composed of strongly condensed nebulous matter, but somewhat eccentrically situated within it was a star-like nucleus of a reddish tinge, which Herschel presumed to be solid, and ascertained, with his usual care, to have a diameter of 428 miles. From the total absence of phases, as well as from the vivacity of its radiance, he confidently inferred that its light was not borrowed, but inherent. This remarkable apparition formed the subject of a memoir by Olbers, the striking yet steadily reasoned out suggestions contained in which there was at that time no means of following up with profit. Only of late has the electrical theory, of which Zöllner regarded Olbers as the founder, assumed a definite and measurable form, capable of being tested by the touchstone of fact, as knowledge makes its slow inroads on the fundamental mystery of the physical universe. The paraboloidal shape of the bright envelope separated by a dark interval from the head of the great comet of 1811, and constituting, as it were, the root of its tail, seemed to the astronomer of Bremen to reveal the presence of a double repulsion. The expelled vapours accumulating were the two forces, solar and cometary, balanced each other, and being then swept backwards in a huge train. He accordingly distinguished three classes of these bodies. First, comets which develop no matter subject to solar repulsion. These have no tails, and are probably mere nebulosities, without solid nuclei. Secondly, comets which are acted upon by solar repulsion only, and consequently throw out no emanations toward the sun. Of this kind was a bright comet visible in 1807. Thirdly, comets like that of 1811, giving evidence of action of both kinds. These are distinguished by a dark hoop encompassing the head and dividing it from the luminous envelope, as well as by an obscure caudal axis, 
resulting from the hollow, cone-like structure of the tail. Again, the ingenious view subsequently propounded by M. Bredikin as to the connection between the form of these appendages and the kind of matter composing them was very clearly anticipated by Olbers. The amount of tail curvature, he pointed out, depends in each case upon the proportion borne by the velocity of the ascending particles to that of the comet in its orbit. The swifter the outrush, the straighter the resulting tail. But the velocity of the ascending particles varies with the energy of their repulsion by the sun, and this again, it may be presumed, with their quality. Thus, multiple tails are developed when the same comet throws off, as it approaches perihelion, specifically distinct substances. The long straight ray which proceeded from the comet of 1807, for example, was doubtless made up of particles subject to a much more vigorous solar repulsion than those formed into the shorter curved emanation issuing from it nearly in the same direction. In the comet of 1811 he calculated that the particles expelled from the head travelled to the remote extremity of the tail in eleven minutes, indicating by this enormous rapidity of movement, comparable to that of the transmission of light, the action of a force much more powerful than the opposing one of gravity. The not uncommon phenomena of multiple envelopes, on the other hand, he explained as due to the varying amounts of repulsion exercised by the nucleus itself on the different kinds of matter developed from it. The movements and perturbations of the comet of 1811 were no less profoundly studied by Argelander than its physical constitution by Olbers. The orbit which he assigned to it is of such vast dimensions as to require no less than 3,065 years for the completion of its circuit, and to carry the body describing it at each revolution to fourteen times the distance from the sun of the frigid Neptune. Thus, when it last visited our neighbourhood, Achilles may have gazed on its imposing train as he lay on the sands all night bewailing the loss of Patroclus and when it returns it will perhaps be to shine upon the ruins of empires and civilizations still deep buried among the secrets of the coming time on the twenty sixth of june eighteen nineteen while the head of a comet passed across the face of the sun the earth was in all probability involved in its tail but of this remarkable double event nothing was known until more than a month later when the fact of its past occurrence emerged from the calculations of Olbers. Nor had the comet itself been generally visible previous to the first days of July. Several observers, however, on the publication of these results, brought forward accounts of singular spots perceived by them upon the sun at the time of the transit, and an original drawing of one of them, by Pastorf of Buchholz, has been preserved. This undoubtedly authentic delineation represents a round nebulous object with a bright spot in the centre, of decidedly cometary aspect, and not in the least like an ordinary solar macula. Mr. Hind, nevertheless, showed its position on the sun to be irreconcilable with that which the comet must have occupied, and Mr. Ranyard's discovery of a similar, smaller drawing by the same author, dated May 26, 1828, reduces to evanescence the probability of its connection with that body. Indeed, recent experience renders very doubtful the possibility of such an observation. The return of Halley's Comet in 1835 was looked forward to as an opportunity for testing the truth of floating cometary theories, and did not altogether disappoint expectation. As early as 1817, its movements and disturbances since 1759 were proposed by the Turin Academy of Sciences as the subject of a prize, ultimately awarded to Baron Damoiseau. Ponte Coulon was adjudged a similar distinction by the Paris Academy in 1829, while Rosenberger's calculations were rewarded with the gold medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. They were verified by the detection at Rome, August 6, 1835, of a nearly circular misty object not far from the predicted place of the comet. 
It was not, however, until the middle of September that it began to throw out a tail, which by the 15th of October had attained a length of about 24 degrees. On the 19th, at Madras, it extended to fully 30. The head showing to the naked eye as a reddish star rather brighter than Aldebaran or Antares. Some curious phenomena accompanied the process of tail formation. An outrush of luminous matter, resembling in shape a partially opened fan, issued from the nucleus towards the sun, and at a certain point, like smoke driven before a high wind, was vehemently swept backwards in a prolonged train. The appearance of the comet at this time was compared by Bessel, who watched it with minute attention, to that of a blazing rocket. He made the singular observation that this fan of light, which seemed the source of supply for the tail, oscillated like a pendulum to and fro across a line joining the sun and nucleus in a period of four three-fifth days, and he was unable to escape from the conclusion that a repulsive force, about twice as powerful as the attractive force of gravity, was concerned in the production of these remarkable effects. Nor did he hesitate to recur to the analogy of magnetic polarity, or to declare, still more emphatically than Olbers, the emission of the tail to be a purely electrical phenomenon. The transformations undergone by this body were almost as strange and complete as those which affected the brigands in Dante's Inferno. When first seen, it wore the aspect of a nebula. Later it put on the distinctive garb of a comet. It next appeared as a star. Finally it dilated, first in a spherical, then in a paraboloidal form, until May 5, 1836, when it vanished from Herschel's observation at Feldhausen, as if by melting into adjacent space from the excessive diffusion of its light. A very uncommon circumstances in its development was that it lost all trace of tail previous to its arrival at Perihelion on the 16th of November. Nor did it begin to recover its elongated shape for more than two months afterwards. On the 23rd of January, Boguslavsky perceived it as a star of the sixth magnitude, without measurable disk. Only two nights later, MacLear, director of the Cape Observatory, found the head to be 131 seconds across. And so rapidly did the augmentation of size progress, that Sir John Herschel estimated the actual bulk of this singular object to have increased fortyfold in the ensuing week. I can hardly doubt, he remarks, that the comet was fairly evaporated in perihelio by the heat, and resolved into transparent vapour, and is now in process of rapid condensation and pre-precipitation on the nucleus. A plausible, but no longer admissible, interpretation of this still unexplained phenomenon. The next return of this body, which will be considerably accelerated by Jupiter's influence, is expected to take place in 1910. By means of an instrument devised to test the quality of light, Arago obtained decisive evidence that some at least of the radiance proceeding from Halley's comet was derived by reflection from the sun. Indications of the same kind had been afforded by the comet which suddenly appeared above the northwestern horizon of Paris, July 3, 1819, after having enveloped, as already stated, our terrestrial abode in its flimsy appendages. But the polariscope had not then reached the perfection subsequently given to it, and its testimony was accordingly far less reliable than in 1835. Such experiments, however, are in reality more beautiful and ingenious than instructive, since ignited as well as obscure bodies possess the power of throwing back light incident upon them, and will consequently transmit to us from the neighbourhood of the sun rays partly direct, partly reflected, of which a certain proportion will exhibit the peculiarity known as polarisation. The most brilliant comets of the century were suddenly rivalled, if not surpassed, by the extraordinary object which blazed out beside the sun, February 28, 1843. It was simultaneously perceived in Mexico and the United States, 
in southern Europe and at sea off the Cape of Good Hope, where the passengers on board the Owen Glendower were amazed by the sight of a short, dagger-like object, closely following the sun towards the western horizon. At Florence, Amici found its distance from the sun's centre at noon to be only one degree twenty-three minutes, and spectators at Parma were able, when sheltered from the direct glare of midday, to trace the tail to a length of four or five degrees. The full dimensions of this astonishing appurtenance began to be disclosed a few days later. On the 3rd of March it measured 25 degrees, and on the 11th, at Calcutta, Mr. Clary Hugh observed a second streamer, nearly twice as long as the first, and making an angle with it of 18 degrees, to have been emitted in a single day. This rapidity of projection, Sir John Herschel remarked, conveys an astounding impression of the intensity of the forces at work. It is clear, he continued, that if we have to deal here with matter such as we conceive it, that is, possessing inertia, at all, it must be under the dominion of forces incomparably more energetic than gravitation, and quite of a different nature. On the 17th of March, a silvery ray, some 40 degrees long and slightly curved at its extremity, shone out above the sunset clouds in this country. No previous intimation had been received of the possibility of such an apparition, and even astronomers, no lightning messages across the seas being as yet possible, were perplexed. The nature of the phenomenon, indeed, soon became evident, but the wonder of it did not diminish with the study of its attendant circumstances. Never before, within astronomical memory, had our system been traversed by a body pursuing such an adventurous career. The closest analogy was offered by the great comet of 1680, Newton's, which rushed past the sun at a distance of only 144,000 miles. But even this, on the cosmical scale, scarcely perceptible interval was reduced nearly one-half in the case we are now concerned with. The centre of the comet of 1843 approached the formidable luminary within 78,000 miles, leaving, it is estimated, a clear space of not more than 32,000 between the surfaces of the bodies brought into such perilous proximity. The escape of the wanderer was, however, secured by the extraordinary rapidity of its flight. It swept past perihelion at a rate, 366 miles a second, which, if continued, would have carried it right round the sun in two hours, and in only eleven minutes more than that short period, it actually described half the curvature of its orbit, an arc of 180 degrees, although in travelling over the remaining half, many hundreds of sluggish years will doubtless be consumed. The behaviour of this comet may be regarded as an experimentum crucis as to the nature of tails, for clearly no fixed appendage many millions of miles in length could be whirled like a brandished sabre from one side of the sun to the other in 131 minutes. Commentary trains are then, as Olbers rightly conceived them to be, emanations, not appendages, inconceivably rapid outflows of highly rarefied matter, the greater part, if not all of which, becomes permanently detached from the nucleus. That of the comet of 1843 reached, about the time that it became visible in this country, the extravagant length of two hundred millions of miles. It was narrow and bounded by nearly parallel and nearly rectilinear lines, resembling, to borrow a comparison of Aristotle's, a road through the constellations, and after the 3rd of March showed no trace of hollowness, the axis being, in fact, rather brighter than the edges. Distinctly perceptible in it were those singular aurora-like coruscations, which gave to the tresses of Charles V's comet the appearance, as Cardan described it, of a torch agitated by the wind, and have not unfrequently been observed to characterize other similar objects. A consideration first adverted to by Olbers proves these to originate in our own atmosphere. 
for owing to the great differences in the distances from the earth of the origin and extremity of such vast effluxes the light proceeding from their various parts is transmitted to our eyes in notably different intervals of time consequently a luminous undulation even though propagated instantaneously from end to end of a comet's tail would appear to us to occupy many minutes in its progress but the coruscations in question pass as swiftly as a falling star they are then of terrestrial production periods of the utmost variety were by different computators assigned to the body which arrived at perihelion february twenty seventh eighteen forty three at nine forty seven p m professor hubbard of washington found that it required five hundred thirty three years to complete the revolution Messieurs Logier and Mauvais of Paris considered the true term to be thirty-five. Clausen looked for its return at the end of between six and seven. A recent discussion by Professor Kreutz of all the available data gives a probable period of five hundred twelve years for this body, and precludes its hypothetical identity with the comet of 1668, known as the Spina of Cassini it may now be asked what were the conclusions regarding the nature of comets drawn by astronomers from the considerable amount of novel experience accumulated during the first half of this century the first and best assured was that the matter composing them is in a state of extreme tenuity numerous and trustworthy observations showed that the feeblest rays of light might traverse some hundreds of thousands of miles of their substance even where it was apparently most condensed without being perceptibly weakened nay instances were recorded in which stars were said to have gained in brightness from the process on the twenty fourth of june eighteen twenty five Olbers saw the comet then visible all but obliterated by the central passage of a star too small to be distinguished with the naked eye its own light remaining wholly unchanged a similar effect was noted december first eighteen eleven when the great comet of that year approached so close to altair the lucida of the eagle that the star seemed to be transformed into the nucleus of the comet even the central blaze of halley's comet in eighteen thirty five was powerless to impede the passage of stellar rays struve observed at dorpat on september seventeen an all but central occultation glacier one so far as he could ascertain absolutely so eight days later at cambridge in neither case was there any appreciable diminution of the star's light again on the eleventh of october eighteen forty seven mr dawes an exceptionally keen observer distinctly saw a star of the tenth magnitude through the exact centre of a comet discovered on the first of that month by maria mitchell of nantucket examples on the other hand are not wanting of the diminution of stellar light under similar circumstances and we meet two alleged instances of the vanishing of a star behind a comet bartmann of geneva observed the first november twenty eighth eighteen twenty eight but his instrument was defective and the eclipsing body Encke's comet has shown itself otherwise perfectly translucent the second case of occultation occurred september thirteenth eighteen ninety when an eleventh magnitude star was stated to have completely disappeared during the transit over it of dennings comet from the failure to detect any effects of refraction in the light of stars occulted by comets it was inferred though as we know now erroneously that their composition is rather that of dust than that of vapour that they consist not of any continuous substance but of discrete solid particles very finely divided and widely scattered in conformity with this view was the known smallness of their masses laplace had shown that if the amount of matter forming lexell's comet had been as much as one five thousandth of that contained in our globe the effect of its attraction on the occasion of its approach within one million four hundred thirty eight thousand miles of the earth july first seventeen seventy must have been apparent in the lengthening of the year and that some comets at any rate possess masses immeasurably below this maximum value 
was clearly proved by the undisturbed parallel march of the two fragments of Bielas in 1846. But the discovery in this branch most distinctive of the period under review is that of short-period comets, of which four were known in 1850. These, by the character of their movements, serve as a link between the planetary and cometary worlds, and by the nature of their construction seem to mark a stage in cometary decay. For that comets are rather transitory agglomerations than permanent products of cosmical manufacture, appeared to be demonstrated by the division and disappearance of one amongst their number, as well as by the singular and rapid changes in appearance undergone by many, and the seemingly irrevocable diffusion of their substance visible in nearly all. They might then be defined, according to the ideas respecting them prevalent fifty years ago, as bodies unconnected by origin with the solar system, but encountered, and to some extent appropriated, by it in its progress through space, owing their visibility in great part, if not altogether, to light reflected from the sun, and their singular and striking forms to the action of repulsive forces emanating from him, the penalty of their evanescent splendour being paid in gradual waste and final dissipation and extinction. End of chapter 5 Part 1, Chapter 6 of A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Popular History of Astronomy During the Nineteenth Century by Agnes Mary Clark. Chapter 6 Instrumental Advances it is impossible to follow with intelligent interest the course of astronomical discovery without feeling some curiosity as to the means by which such surpassing results have been secured indeed the bare acquaintance with what has been achieved without any corresponding knowledge of how it has been achieved supplies food for barren wonder rather than for fruitful and profitable thought ideas advance most readily along the solid ground of practical reality and often find true sublimity while laying aside empty marvels progress is the result not so much of sudden flights of genius as of sustained patient often commonplace endeavour and the true lesson of scientific history lies in the close connection which it discloses between the most brilliant developments of knowledge and the faithful accomplishment of his daily task by each individual thinker and worker it would be easy to fill a volume with the detailed account of the long succession of optical and mechanical improvements by means of which the observation of the heavens has been brought to its present degree of perfection but we must here content ourselves with a summary sketch of the chief amongst them the first place in our consideration is naturally claimed by the telescope this marvellous instrument we need hardly remind our readers is of two distinct kinds that in which light is gathered together into a focus by refraction and that in which the same end is attained by reflection the image formed is in each case viewed through a magnifying lens or a combination of lenses called the eyepiece not for above a century after the optic glass is invented or stumbled upon by the spectacle maker of middleburg sixteen o eight had become diffused over europe did the reflecting telescope come even in england the place of its birth into general use its principle a sufficiently obvious one had indeed been suggested by mersenne as early as sixteen thirty nine james gregory in sixteen sixty three described in detail a mode of embodying that principle in a practical shape and newton adopting an original system of construction actually produced in sixteen sixty eight a tiny speculum one inch across by means of which the apparent distance of objects was reduced thirty-nine times nevertheless the exorbitantly long tubeless refractors introduced by huygens 
maintained their reputation until hadley exhibited to the royal society january twelfth seventeen twenty one a reflector of six inches aperture and sixty-two in focal length which rivalled in performance and of course indefinitely surpassed in manageability one of the aerial kind of one hundred and twenty-three feet the concave mirror system now gained a decided ascendant and was brought to unexampled perfection by james short of edinburgh during the years seventeen thirty two to sixty eight its resources were however first fully developed by william herschel the energy and inventiveness of this extraordinary man marked an epoch wherever they were applied his ardent desire to measure and gauge the stupendous array of worlds which his specula revealed to him made him continually intent upon adding to their space penetrating power by increasing their light gathering surface these as he was the first to explain are in a constant proportion one to the other for a telescope with twice the linear aperture of another will collect four times as much light and will consequently disclose an object four times as faint as could be seen with the first or what comes to the same an object equally bright at twice the distance in other words it will possess double the space penetrating power of the smaller instrument herschel's great mirrors the first examples of the giant telescopes of modern times were then primarily engines for extending the bounds of the visible universe and from the sublimity of this final cause was derived the vivid enthusiasm which animated his efforts to success it seems probable that the seven-foot telescope constructed by him in seventeen seventy five that is within little more than a year after his experiments in shaping and polishing metal had begun already exceeded in effective power any work by an earlier optician and both his skill and his ambition rapidly developed his efforts culminated after mirrors of ten twenty and thirty feet focal length had successively left his hands in the gigantic forty foot completed august twenty eighth seventeen eighty nine it was the first reflector in which only a single mirror was employed in the gregorian form the focused rays are by a second reflection from a small concave mirror thrown straight back through a central aperture in the larger one behind which the eyepiece is fixed the object under examination is thus seen in the natural direction the newtonian on the other hand shows the object in a line of sight at right angles to the true one the light collected by the speculum being diverted to one side of the tube by the interposition of a small plane mirror situated at an angle of forty five degrees to the axis of the instrument upon these two systems herschel worked until seventeen eighty seven when becoming convinced of the supreme importance of economizing light necessarily wasted by the second reflection he laid aside the small mirror of his forty foot then in course of construction and turned it into a front view reflector this was done according to the plan proposed by le maire in seventeen thirty two by slightly inclining the speculum so as to enable the image formed by it to be viewed with an eyeglass fixed at the upper margin of the tube the observer thus stood with his back turned to the object he was engaged in scrutinizing the advantages of the increased brilliancy afforded by this modification were strikingly illustrated by the discovery august twenty eighth and september seventeenth seventeen eighty nine of the two saturnian satellites nearest the ring nevertheless the monster telescope of slough cannot be said to have realized the sanguine expectations of its constructor the occasions on which it could be usefully employed were found to be extremely rare it was injuriously affected by every change of, of temperature the great weight twenty five hundred weight of a speculum four feet in diameter rendered it peculiarly liable to distortion with all imaginable care the delicate lustre of its surface could not be preserved longer than two years when the difficult process of repolishing had to be undertaken 
it was accordingly never used after eighteen eleven when having gone blind from damp it lapsed by degrees into the condition of a museum inmate the exceedingly high magnifying powers employed by herschel constituted a novelty in optical astronomy to which he attached great importance the work of ordinary observation would however be hindered rather than helped by them the attempt to increase in this manner the efficacy of the telescope is speedily checked by atmospheric to say nothing of other difficulties precisely in the same proportion as an object is magnified the disturbances of the medium through which it is seen are magnified also even on the clearest and most tranquil nights the air is never for a moment really still the rays of light traversing it are continually broken by minute fluctuations of refractive power caused by changes of temperature and pressure and the currents which these engender with such luminous quiverings and waverings the astronomer has always more or less to reckon their absence is simply a question of degree if sufficiently magnified they are at all times capable of rendering observation impossible thus such powers as three thousand four thousand five thousand even six thousand six hundred and fifty two which herschel now and again applied to his great telescopes must save on the rarest occasions prove an impediment rather than an aid to vision they were however used by him only for special purposes experimentally not systematically and with the clearest discrimination of their advantages and drawbacks it is obvious that perfectly different ends are subserved by increasing the aperture and by increasing the power of a telescope in the one case a larger quantity of light is captured and concentrated in the other the same amount is distributed over a wider area a diminution of brilliancy in the image accordingly attends citeris paribus upon each augmentation of its apparent size for this reason such faint objects as nebulae are most successfully observed with moderate powers applied to instruments of a great capacity for light the details of their structure actually disappearing when highly magnified with stellar groups the reverse is the case stars cannot be magnified simply because they are too remote to have any sensible dimensions but the space between them can it was thus for the purpose of dividing very close double stars that herschel increased to such an unprecedented extent the magnifying capabilities of his instruments and to this improvement incidentally the discovery of uranus march thirteenth seventeen eighty one was due for by the examination with strong lenses of an object which even with a power of two hundred and twenty seven presented a suspicious appearance he was able at once to pronounce its disc to be real not merely spurious and so to distinguish it unerringly from the crowd of stars amidst which it was moving while the reflecting telescope was astonishing the world by its rapid development in the hands of herschel its unpretending rival was slowly making its way towards the position which the future had in store for it the great obstacle which long stood in the way of the improvement of refractors was the defect known as chromatic aberration this is due to no other cause than that which produces the rainbow and the spectrum the separation or dispersion in their passage through a refracting medium of the variously coloured rays composing a beam of white light in an ordinary lens there is no common point of concentration each colour has its own separate focus and the resulting image formed by the superposition of as many images as there are hues in the spectrum is indefinitely terminated with a tinted border eminently baffling to exactness of observation the extravagantly long telescopes of the seventeenth century were designed to avoid this evil as well as another source of indistinct vision in the spherical shape of lenses but no attempt to remedy it was made until an essex gentleman succeeded in seventeen thirty three in so combining lenses of flint and crown glass as to produce refraction without colour mr chester moore hall was however equally indifferent to fame and profit and took no pains to make his invention public 
the effective discovery of the achromatic telescope was accordingly reserved for john doland whose method of correcting at the same time chromatic and spherical aberration was laid before the royal society in seventeen fifty eight modern astronomy may be said to have been thereby rendered possible refractors have always been found better suited than reflectors to the ordinary work of observatories they are so to speak of a more robust as well as of a more plastic nature they suffer less from vicissitudes of temperature and climate they retain their efficiency with fewer precautions and under more trying circumstances above all they co-operate more readily with mechanical appliances and lend themselves with far greater facility to purposes of exact measurement a practical difficulty however impeded the realization of the brilliant prospects held out by dolan's invention it was found impossible to procure flint glass such as was needed for optical use that is of perfectly homogeneous quality except in fragments of insignificant size discs of more than two or three inches in diameter were of extreme rarity and the crushing excise duty imposed upon the article by the financial unwisdom of the government both limited its production and by rendering experiments too costly for repetition barred its improvement up to this time great britain had left foreign competitors far behind in the instrumental department of astronomy the quadrants and circles of bird carey and ramsden were unapproached abroad the reflecting telescope came into existence and reached maturity on british soil the refracting telescope was cured of its inherent vices by british ingenuity but with the opening of the nineteenth century the almost unbroken monopoly of skill and contrivance which our countrymen had succeeded in establishing was invaded and british workmen had to be content to exchange a position of supremacy for one of at least partial temporary inferiority somewhat about the time that herschel set about polishing his first speculum pierre louis guinon a swiss artisan living near chaux de fonds in the canton of neuchatel began to grind spectacles for his own use and was thence led on to the rude construction of telescopes by fixing lenses in pasteboard tubes the sight of an england achromatic stirred a higher ambition and he took the first opportunity of procuring some flint glass from england then the only source of supply with the design of imitating an instrument the full capabilities of which he was destined to be the humble means of developing the english glass proving of inferior quality he conceived the possibility unaided and ignorant of the art as he was of himself making better and spent seven years seventeen eighty four to ninety in fruitless experiments directed to that end failure only stimulated him to enlarge their scale he bought some land near les Brenet, constructed upon it a furnace capable of melting two quintals of glass and reducing himself and his family to the barest necessaries of life he poured his earnings he at this time made bells for repeaters unstintingly into his crucibles his undaunted resolution triumphed in seventeen ninety nine he carried to paris and there showed to lalande several discs of flawless crystal four to six inches in diameter lalande advised him to keep his secret but in eighteen o five he was induced to remove to munich where he became the instructor of the immortal fraunhofer his return to les Brunets in eighteen fourteen was signalized by the discovery of an ingenious mode of removing striated portions of glass by breaking and resoldering the product of each melting and he eventually attained to the manufacture of perfect discs up to eighteen inches in diameter an object glass for which he had furnished the material to cauchois procured him in eighteen twenty three a royal invitation to settle in paris but he was no longer equal to the change and died at the scene of his labours february thirteen following 
this same lens twelve inches across was afterwards purchased by sir james south and the first observation made with it february thirteenth eighteen thirty disclosed to sir john herschel the sixth minute star in the central group of the orion nebula known as the trapezium bequeathed by south to trinity college dublin it was employed at the dunsink observatory by brunnow and ball in their investigations of stellar parallax a still larger objective of nearly fourteen inches made of guinon's glass was secured in paris about the same time by mr edward cooper of marcree castle ireland the peculiarity of the method discovered at le brunet resided in the manipulation not in the quality of the ingredients the secret that is to say was not chemical but mechanical it was communicated by henri guinon a son of the inventor to bonton one of the directors of the glass works at choisy le roi and by him transmitted to messrs chance birmingham with whom he entered into partnership when the revolutionary troubles of eighteen forty eight obliged him to quit his native country the celebrated american opticians alvin clark and sons derived from the birmingham firm the materials for some of their early telescopes notably the nineteen inch chicago and twenty six inch washington equatorials but the discs for the great lick refractor and others shaped by them in recent years have been supplied by faille of paris two distinguished amateurs meanwhile were preparing to reassert on behalf of reflecting instruments their claim to the place of honour in the van of astronomical discovery of mr lascelles specula something has already been said they were composed of an alloy of copper and tin with a minute proportion of arsenic after the example of newton and were remarkable for perfection of figure and brilliancy of surface the capabilities of the newtonian plan were developed still more fully it might almost be said to the uttermost by the enterprise of an irish nobleman william parsons known as lord oxmantown until eighteen forty one when on his father's death he succeeded to the title of earl of rossi was born at york june seventeenth eighteen hundred his public duties began before his education was completed he was returned to parliament as member for king's county while still an undergraduate at oxford and continued to represent the same constituency for thirteen years eighteen twenty one to thirty four from eighteen forty five until his death which took place october thirty one eighteen sixty seven he sat silent but assiduous in the house of lords as an irish representative peer he held the not unlaborious post of president of the royal society from eighteen forty nine to eighteen fifty four presided over the meeting of the british association at cork in eighteen forty three and was elected vice-chancellor of dublin university in eighteen sixty two in addition to these extensive demands upon his time and thoughts were those derived from his position as practically the feudal chief of a large body of tenantry in times of great and anxious responsibility to say nothing of the more genial claims of an unstinted hospitality yet while neglecting no public or private duty this model nobleman found leisure to render to science services so conspicuous as to entitle his name to a lasting place in its annals he early formed the design of reaching the limits of the attainable in enlarging the powers of the telescope and the qualities of his mind conspired with the circumstances of his fortune to render the design a feasible one from refractors it was obvious that no such vast and rapid advance could be expected english glass manufacture was still in a backward state so late as eighteen thirty nine sims successor to the distinguished instrumentalist edward troughton reported a specimen of crystal scarcely seven and a half inches in diameter and perfect only over six to be unique in the history of english glass making yet at the time the fifteen-inch achromatic of polkawa had already left the workshop of fraunhofer's successors at munich 
it was not indeed until eighteen forty five when the impost which had so long hampered their efforts was removed that the optical artists of these islands were able to compete on equal terms with their rivals on the continent in the case of reflectors however there seemed no insurmountable obstacle to an almost unlimited increase of light-gathering capacity and it was here after some unproductive experiments with fluid lenses that lord oxmantown concentrated his energies he had to rely entirely on his own invention and to earn his own experience james short had solved the problem of giving to metallic surfaces a perfect parabolic figure the only one by which parallel incident rays can be brought to an exact focus but so jealous was he of his secret that he caused all his tools to be burnt before his death nor was anything known of the processes by which herschel had achieved his astonishing results moreover lord oxmantown had no skilled workmen to assist him his implements both animate and inanimate had to be formed by himself peasants taken from the plough were educated by him into efficient mechanics and engineers the delicate and complex machinery needed in operations of such hairbreadth nicety as his enterprise involved the steam engine which was to set it in motion at times the very crucibles in which his specula were cast issued from his own workshops in eighteen twenty seven experiments on the composition of speculum metal were set on foot and the first polishing machine ever driven by steam power was contrived in eighteen twenty eight but twelve arduous years of struggle with recurring difficulties passed before success began to dawn a material less tractable than the alloy selected of four chemical equivalents of copper to one of tin can scarcely be conceived it is harder than steel yet brittle as glass crumbling into fragments with the slightest inadvertence of handling or treatment and the precision of figure requisite to secure good definition is almost beyond the power of language to convey the quantities involved are so small as not alone to elude sight but to confound imagination sir john herschel tells us that the total thickness to be abraded from the edge of a spherical speculum forty-eight inches in diameter and forty feet focus to convert it into a paraboloid is only one twenty one thousand three hundred and thirty third of an inch yet upon this minute difference of form depends the clearness of the image and as a consequence the entire efficiency of the instrument almost infinite indeed in the phrase of the late dr robinson must be the exactitude of the operation adapted to bring about so delicate a result at length in eighteen thirty nine two specula each three feet in diameter were turned out in such perfection as to prompt a still bolder experiment the various processes needed to ensure success were now ascertained and under control all that was necessary was to repeat them on a larger scale a gigantic mirror six feet across and fifty-four in focal length was accordingly cast on the thirteenth of april eighteen forty two in two months it was ground down to figure by abrasion with emery and water and daintily polished with rouge and by the month of february eighteen forty five the leviathan of parson town was available for the examination of the heavens the suitable mounting of this vast machine was a problem scarcely less difficult than its construction the shape of a speculum needs to be maintained with an elaborate care equal to that used in imparting it in fact one of the most formidable obstacles to increasing the size of such reflecting surfaces consists in their liability to bend under their own weight that of the great rossi speculum was no less than four tons yet although six inches in thickness and composed of a material only a degree inferior in rigidity to wrought iron the strong pressure of a man's hand at its back produced sufficient flexure to distort perceptibly the image of a star reflected in it thus the delicacy of its form was perishable equally by the stress of its own gravity and by the slightest irregularity in the means taken to counteract that stress the problem of affording a perfectly equable support in all possible positions was solved by resting the speculum upon twenty-seven platforms of cast iron felt covered and carefully fitted to the shape of the areas they were to carry which platforms were themselves borne by a complex system 
of triangles and levers ingeniously adapted to distribute the weight with complete uniformity a tube which resembled when erect one of the ancient round towers of ireland served as the habitation of the great mirror it was constructed of deal staves bound together with iron hoops was fifty-eight feet long including the speculum box and seven in diameter a reasonably tall man may walk through it as dean peacock once did with umbrella uplifted two piers of solid masonry about fifty feet high seventy long and twenty-three apart flanked the huge engine on either side its lower extremity rested on a universal joint of cast iron above it was slung in chains and even in a gale of wind remained perfectly steady the weight of the entire although amounting to fifteen tons was so skilfully counterpoised that the tube could with ease be raised or depressed by two men working a windlass its horizontal range was limited by the lofty walls erected for its support to about ten degrees on each side of the meridian but it moved vertically from near the horizon through the zenith as far as the pole its construction was of the newtonian kind the observer looking into the side of the tube near its upper end which a series of galleries and sliding stages enabled him to reach in any position it has also though rarely been used without a second mirror as a herschelian reflector the splendor of the celestial objects as viewed with this vast light grasper surpassed all expectation never in my life exclaimed sir james south did i see such glorious sidereal pictures the orb of jupiter produced an effect compared to that of the introduction of a coach lamp into the telescope and certain star clusters exhibited an appearance we again quote sir james south such as man before had never seen and which for its magnificence baffles all description but it was in the examination of the nebulae that the superiority of the new instrument was most strikingly displayed a large number of these misty objects which the utmost powers of herschel's specula had failed to resolve into stars yielded at once to the parsontown reflector while many others showed under entirely changed forms through the disclosure of previously unseen details of structure one extremely curious result of the increase of light was the abolition of any sharp distinction between the two classes of annular and planetary nebulae up to that time only four ring-shaped systems two in the northern and two in the southern hemisphere were known to astronomers they were now reinforced by five of the planetary kind the disks of which were observed to be centrally perforated while the definite margins visible in weaker instruments were replaced by ragged edges or filamentous fringes still more striking was the discovery of an entirely new and most remarkable species of nebulae these were termed spiral from the more or less regular convolutions resembling the whirls of a shell in which the matter composing them appeared to be distributed the first and most conspicuous specimen of this class was met with in april eighteen forty five it is situated in canis venatici close to the tail of the great bear and wore in sir j herschel's instruments the aspect of a split ring encompassing a bright nucleus thus presenting as he supposed a complete analogue to the system of the milky way in the rossi mirror it shone out as a vast whirlpool of light a stupendous witness to the presence of cosmical activities on the grandest scale yet regulated by laws as to the nature of which we are profoundly ignorant professor stephen alexander of new jersey however concluded from an investigation necessarily founded on highly precarious data of the mechanical condition of these extraordinary agglomerations that we see in them the partially scattered fragments of enormous masses once rotating in a state of dynamical equilibrium he further suggested that the separation of these fragments may still be in progress and trace back their origin to the disruption through its own continually accelerated rotation of a 
primitive spheroid of inconceivably vast dimensions such also it was added the curvilinear form of certain outliers of the milky way giving evidence of a spiral structure is probably the history of our own cluster the stars composing which no longer held together in a delicately adjusted system like that of the sun and planets are advancing through a period of seeming confusion towards an appointed goal of higher order and more perfect and harmonious adaptation the class of spiral nebulae included in eighteen fifty fourteen members besides several in which the characteristic arrangement seemed partial or dubious a tendency in the exterior stars of other clusters to gather into curved branches as in our galaxy was likewise noted and the existence of unsuspected analogies was proclaimed by the significant combination in the owl nebula a large planetary in ursa major of the twisted forms of a spiral with the perforated effect distinctive of an annular nebula once more by the achievements of the parsontown reflector the supposition of a shining fluid filling vast regions of space was brought into as it has since proved undeserved discredit although lord rossi himself rejected the inference that because many nebulae had been resolved all were resolvable very few imitated his truly scientific caution and the results of bond's investigations with the harvard college refractor quickened and strengthened the current of prevalent opinion it is now certain that the evidence furnished on both sides of the atlantic as to the stellar composition of some conspicuous objects of this class notably the orion and dumbbell nebulae was delusive but the spectroscope alone was capable of meeting it with a categorical denial meanwhile there seemed good ground for the persuasion which now for the last time gained the upper hand that nebulae are without exception true island universes or assemblages of distant suns lord rossi's telescope possesses a nominal power of six thousand that is it shows the moon as if viewed with the naked eye at a distance of forty miles but this seeming advantage is neutralized by the weakening of the available light through excessive diffusion as well as by the troubles of the surging sea of air through which the observation must necessarily be made professor newcomb in fact doubts whether with any telescope our satellite has ever been seen to such advantage as it would be if brought within five hundred miles of the unarmed eye the french opticians rule of doubling the number of millimetres contained in the aperture of an instrument to find the highest magnifying power usually applicable to it would give three thousand six hundred as the maximum for the leviathan of burr castle but in a climate like that of ireland the occasions must be rare when even that limit can be reached indeed the experience acquired by its use plainly shows that atmospheric rather than mechanical difficulties impede a still further increase of telescopic power its construction may accordingly be said to mark the ne plus ultra of effort in one direction and the beginning of its conversion towards another it became thenceforward more and more obvious that the conditions of observation must be ameliorated before any added efficacy could be given to it the full effect of an uncertain climate in nullifying optical improvements was recognized and the attention of astronomers began to be turned towards the advantages offered by more tranquil and more translucent skies scarcely less important for the practical uses of astronomy than the optical qualities of the telescope is the manner of its mounting the most admirable performance of the optician can render but unsatisfactory service if its mechanical accessories are ill-arranged or inconvenient thus the astronomer is ultimately dependent upon the mechanician and so excellently have his needs been served that the history of the ingenious contrivances by which discoveries have been prepared would supply a subject here barely glanced at not far inferior in extent and instruction to the history of those discoveries themselves there are two chief modes of using the telescope to which all others may be considered subordinate either it may be invariably directed towards the south 
with no motion save in the plane of the meridian so as to intercept the heavenly bodies at the moment of transit across that plane or it may be arranged so as to follow the daily revolution of the sky thus keeping the object viewed permanently in sight instead of simply noting the instant of its flitting across the telescopic field the first plan is that of the transit instrument the second that of the equatorial both were by a remarkable coincidence introduced about sixteen ninety by oleas rumor the brilliant danish astronomer who first measured the velocity of light the uses of each are entirely different with the transit the really fundamental task of astronomy the determination of the movements of the heavenly bodies is mainly accomplished while the investigation of their nature and peculiarities is best conducted with the equatorial one is the instrument of mathematical the other of descriptive astronomy one furnishes the materials with which theories are constructed and the tests by which they are corrected the other registers new facts takes note of new appearances sounds the depths and peers into every nook of the heavens the great improvement of giving to a telescope equatorially mounted an automatic movement by connecting it with clockwork was proposed in sixteen seventy four by robert hooke bradley in seventeen twenty one actually observed mars with a telescope moved by a machine that made it keep pace with the stars and von zach relates that he had once followed sirius for twelve hours with a heliostat of ramsden's construction but these eighteenth-century attempts were of no practical effect movement by clockwork was virtually a complete novelty when it was adopted by fraunhofer in eighteen twenty four to the dorpat refractor by simply giving to an axis unvaryingly directed towards the celestial pole an equable rotation with a period of twenty-four hours a telescope attached to it and pointed in any direction will trace out on the sky a parallel of declination thus necessarily accompanying the movement of any star upon which it may be fixed it accordingly forms part of the large sum of fraunhofer's merits to have secured this inestimable advantage to observers sir john herschel considered that lassell's application of equatorial mounting to a nine-inch newtonian in eighteen forty made an epoch in the history of that eminently british instrument the reflecting telescope nearly a century earlier it is true short had fitted one of his gregorians to a complicated system of circles in such a manner that by moving a handle it could be made to follow the revolution of the sky but the arrangement did not obtain nor did it deserve general adoption lassell's plan was a totally different one he employed the crossed axes of the true equatorial and his success removed to a great extent the fatal objection of inconvenience in use until then unanswerably urged against reflectors the very largest of these can now be mounted equatorially even the rossi within its limited range has been for some years provided with a movement by clockwork along declination parallels the art of accurately dividing circular arcs into the minute equal parts which serve as the units of astronomical measurement remained during the whole of the eighteenth century almost exclusively in english hands it was brought to a high degree of perfection by graham bird and ramsden all of whom however gave the preference to the old-fashioned mural quadrant and zenith sector over the entire circle which rumour had already found the advantage of employing the five-foot vertical circle which piazzi with some difficulty induced ramsden to complete for him in seventeen eighty nine was the first divided instrument constructed in what may be called the modern style it was provided with magnifiers for reading off the divisions one of the neglected improvements of rumour and was set up above a smaller horizontal circle forming an altitude and azimuth combination again rumours invention by which both the elevation of a celestial object above the horizon and its position as referred to the horizon could be measured in the same year borda invented the repeating circle the principle of which had been suggested by tobias mayer in seventeen fifty six a device for exterminating so far as possible errors of gradation by repeating an observation with different parts of the limb this was perhaps the earliest 
systematic effort to correct the imperfections of instruments by the manner of their use the manufacture of astronomical circles was brought to a very refined state of excellence early in the nineteenth century by reichenbach at munich and after eighteen eighteen by repsold at hamburg bessel states that the reading off on an instrument of the kind by the latter artist was accurate to about one eightieth of a human hair meanwhile the traditional reputation of the english school was fully sustained and sir george airy did not hesitate to express his opinion that the new method of graduating circles published by troughton in eighteen o nine was the greatest improvement ever made in the art of instrument making but a more secure road to improvement than that of mere mechanical exactness was pointed out by bessel his introduction of a regular theory of instrumental errors might almost be said to have created a new art of observation every instrument he declared in memorable words must be twice made once by the artist and again by the observer knowledge is power defects that are ascertained and can be allowed for are as good as non-existent thus the truism that the best instrument is worthless in the hands of a careless or clumsy observer became supplemented by the converse maxim that defective appliances may through skilful use be made to yield valuable results the Kernensberg observations of which the first instalment was published in eighteen fifteen set the example of regular reduction for instrumental errors since then it has become an elementary part of an astronomer's duty to study the idiosyncrasy of each one of the mechanical contrivances at his disposal in order that its inevitable but now certified deviations from ideal accuracy may be included amongst the numerous corrections by which the pure essence of even approximate truth is distilled from the rude impressions of sense nor is this enough for the casual circumstances attending each observation have to be taken into account with no less care than the inherent or constitutional peculiarities of the instrument with which it is made there is no once for all in astronomy vigilance can never sleep patience can never tire variable as well as constant sources of error must be anxiously heeded one infinitesimal inaccuracy must be weighed against another all the forces and vicissitudes of nature frosts dews winds the interchanges of heat the disturbing effects of gravity the shiverings of the air the tremors of the earth the weight and vital warmth of the observer's own body nay the rate at which his brain receives and transmits its impressions must all enter into his calculations and be sifted out from his results it was in eighteen twenty three that bessel drew attention to discrepancies in the times of transits given by different astronomers the quantities involved were far from insignificant he was himself nearly a second in advance of all his contemporaries argelander lagging behind him as much as a second and a quarter each individual in fact was found to have a certain definite rate of perception which under the name of personal equation now forms so important an element in the correction of observations that a special instrument for accurately determining its amount in each case is in actual use at greenwich such are the refinements upon which modern astronomy depends for its progress it is a science of hairbreadths and fractions of a second it exists only by the rigid enforcement of arduous accuracy and unwearying diligence whatever secrets the universe still has in store for man will only be communicated on these terms they are it must be acknowledged difficult to comply with they involve an unceasing struggle against the infirmities of his nature and the instabilities of his position but the end is not unworthy the sacrifices demanded one additional ray of light thrown on the marvels of creation a single minutest encroachment upon the strongholds of ignorance is recompense enough for a lifetime of toil or rather the toil is its own reward if pursued in the lofty spirit which alone becomes it for it leads through the abysses of space and the unending vistas of time to the very threshold of that infinity and eternity of which the disclosure is reserved for a life to come End of part one chapter six